You are watching DHTV from California State University to Mingus Hills. Hi, I'm Dr. Pamela Kreiser, and welcome back to NCR 507, which is Research Design and Interpretation. Today we're going to talk about two very important distinctions as we conduct research. The first area is to talk about primary data collection, and the second area is to talk about secondary data collection. Now when we think about primary data collection, th this is the data collection that we do that originates with you and I as the researchers. It's data that hasn't been collected before. And just simply, we would say secondary data then is the kind of data that has already been collected by someone else, but we might use that for our research. So let's start by talking about primary data collection. So far in this show, we've talked about our, during our last session, the idea of using surveys. We know that surveys are a very powerful tool. They're very common in research, and we know that they are widely, widely used. So when we think about survey research, um, we were able to previously identify that questions are very important, the structure, the format, the directions, all of those careful decisions have to be made. And that once we've made those decisions and put together the survey, then we've been able to disseminate it. And then previously, we've also talked about the notion of analyzing those data and then um, also interpreting the results. So we've talked about surveys uh, very specifically in terms of one method of primary data collection. So now we wanna talk about that second area of primary data collection, and that is the area of ethnography and participant observation. Now, when we think about ethnography, we think about it as the overarching term that we use to describe becoming immersed in an area to try to learn about it. Um, technically, we think about ethnography as the recording and analysis of culture or society. Let's take a look at this first clip that features Dr. Gerben Moerman from the University of Amsterdam. And in this clip, he helps us understand the basics of ethnography. First lecture on observation with a different method, with ethnography. And obviously for me, it's not weird because ethnography is a very important method. Ethnography is a method in which observation plays a huge role. And according to some authors, ethnography is an epistemology rather than just a method. It's more than just a method. So let's start thinking about ethnography. What is ethnography? Ethnography is first and foremost an idea. The idea of ethnography is that a researcher stays for a longer period of time with a group he or she is studying. And this staying means working together, eating together, partying together, having fun, leisure, uh, going to church or a mosque or uh, whatever re religious gathering together in order to understand the people in the study. And for many researchers, um, ethnography is uh, equated with the main method within ethnography, and that is participant observation. In another lecture, I will say something about participant observation. But ethnography is often combined with other methods. The goal of ethnography is to try to understand the people in the study. So by staying for a prolonged period of time with people, participating with them, as well as observing them, we try to understand a certain group. So if you do participant observation within a football team, for instance, you try to understand the local norms and values of this specific group. You try to understand the norms and values of this football team, for instance. For some people, when they refer to ethnography, they refer to the written product, the book. This is a beautiful ethnography. In his ethnography, Malinowski said this and that. So it's often used to refer to a book, but when we discuss it within this course, we often refer to it as a method. So where does this me method come from? And it's always fun to look into the origins of different research methods. And some would claim that Herodotus was one of the first ethnographers, and probably the first ethnographers. 
he wrote this book Historia while traveling through the Mediterranean, speaking with people, eating with them, staying with them, and in order to try to understand them. Others would claim that the origins of ethnography lies with travelers, people like Ibn Battuta, uh, who traveled from Morocco throughout Asia, Marco Polo uh, as a traveler, and there were others as well, or colonial servants, people like uh, Jakob Hafner. Others would claim that the first ethnographers were German explorers in Siberia. At least they coined the term ethnography and they worked for Peter the Great in order to try to understand different groups, tribes as they call them, in Siberia. For sociology, I think Beatrice Potter Webb is one of the first ethnographers, although her participant observation was rather short. Some authors claim that she only stayed for a few days rather than months in the sweatshop she's describing. But at least she made the claim that through ethnography, we can gain understanding in a, a different and probably better way, at least of the poor she was studying. Um, Bronislav Malinowski is often claimed by anthropologists as the first ethnographer because he stayed for a real prolonged period of time on the Trobian Islands. He was stuck there because of the the Great War. Um, it was the only place he could possibly stay. He wasn't allowed in Australia, so he stayed at the Trobian Islands and did his famous research, among other things, the Kula trade. So this ethnography, it's a method, at least that's how we discuss it, and we discuss it as ethnographic fieldwork. And this fieldwork, as I said before, consists of all kinds of methods. Many people would say, participant observation, but it's more than just participant observation. It's also direct observations, unobtrusive observations, interviews in all kinds of forms, and document analysis. But the main part of participant observation is this, participation and observation. And in some other lectures, I will be talking about how to participate or how to think about participation and uh, how to think about observation. So we can see that as we talk about the idea of ethnography, that part of ethnography is this idea of participant observation. But ethnography would also include these other aspects, as Dr. Moorman said, um, to include maybe even outside observations where we aren't participating. So we think of ethnography as sort of a broader term. Um, but to be sure, in any of those situations, we have to immerse ourselves in the situation to be able to make those observations. And so um, what he was talking about was this idea, of course, of the participant observer. And that's where we truly immerse ourselves in the day-to-day -day activities of those we are studying. Now, I like to talk about this idea by breaking apart the two terms. We think about participant and observer. I participate in that I'm in the daily activities, and then I observe in that I make observations about what I'm seeing. And of course, I'd have to create notes, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But um, I participate actively, and then I also observe. Now, what's interesting about that is Bogdan and Taylor said that there are actually markers of a good participant observer. Because if you think about it, to be a good participant observer, I would have to get embedded in the culture enough to be able to be seen as maybe a normal part of that environment. So Bogdan and Taylor, they say some of the markers of transitioning into that role are joking around, um, empathizing, maybe sharing concerns mutually or experiences. Um, all of these are ideas that kind of point to the idea that, um, or they're, sorry, they're markers that would point to the idea of whether you're an insider or not. And you and I have experienced that before. Of course, this notion that when somebody is an insider, we might speak more freely or act more authentically than if we have an outsider present in our environment. So when you're thinking about doing participant observation, of course, one of the keys is to kind of bridge that gap and become the insider. Now, the next clip we're going to take a look at is Dr. Mormon again. And uh, he's going to help us understand more about being a participant observer. In this lecture on participant observation, I would like to focus a bit on participation. But first, I would like to say something about why should we do participant observation? And there are several reasons for that. 
The first reason is that it provides many different kinds of data. For instance, if you participate and you observe and you write little notes about it, these little notes are a certain type of data, field notes. But you also make pictures probably, or you make videos or audio recordings. And maybe you collect some data in the sense of, of documents that uh, people give you or you can lay hand on. So you gather all kinds of data. Second reason why I think participant observation is an important method, it provides naturally occurring data, which means that things go on as usual when you're there. Well, obviously there's some reactivity, as it's called. There's some reactivity. People react on you as a participant observer. But if you stay for a prolonged period of time, then probably the data you gather is naturally occurring. Way more natural, probably, than what you have when you do an interview. Thirdly, participant observation provides in-depth data. Because you stay for a prolonged period of time and get a little deeper. So you can dig a little deeper. You learn to know some people and you learn to know how stuff works. It's not superficial one-time uh, hit of uh, data gathering. Well, the fourth uh, reason why we uh, should do participant observation is it's contextualized data. So it's naturally occurring, it's in-depth, but it's also contextualized, so rather broad within a certain context. And especially if you stay for a longer period of time, this context becomes clearer and clearer and clearer. There's a historical context as well as a social context. More on that later, obviously. It provides data, but it also facilitates other methods. For instance, when doing participant observation, you can learn so much of a special group or a special social situation that a preparation for an interview is pretty easy. Preparation for a survey study is pretty easy because you already did a pre-study. So it works great as a pre-study because of this contextualized knowledge, because of this in-depth knowledge. And it helps also a lot on interpretation of, for instance, survey results. So participant observation is an important method, but the main thing for me is it's the coolest research method because you can go out, participate with people, study them at the same time. There are some special features of participant observation and many authors write a lot about access. And in this course, we won't be discussing much on, on access, but access is very important. Um, obviously, participation is important. Your background, your skills, and your impression management. I will explain them later. What is also important is obviously observation and observation meaning watching listening smelling feeling and tasting and some would say posing questions as well and the fourth important feature of participant observation is writing and i later on in this course we will say something about writing as well let's talk about personal background because when you try to observe a naturally occurring situation, you bring yourself in. So people react on you. There's reactivity. Your age, your gender, um, your class, your ethnicity, your religion, they all play a role. And not just your age, your gender, class, ethnicity, religion, but many other features as well. And some of those features you can't really change easily. Well, you can pretend to be of higher class or you can pretend uh, uh, a certain religion but usually it's a bit hard to change in, in uh, ethnicity and gender uh, as well and there's a, 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 a last part of it because if people perceive you to be of a certain age a certain gender a certain ethnicity then it doesn't really matter when, whether you are really of a certain ethnicity or religion the perception is there so when you do participant observation you have to deal with those stuff it's not just background where you have to reflect on. You also have to reflect on your personal skills and there are quite some skills necessary for participant observation. The first is language skills. I studied Tamil for one year before doing field work in Sri Lanka. 
And I really tried hard uh, in writing and reading uh, Tamil. And when I came in Sri Lanka, I didn't understand a word of the people and the people didn't understand a word from me. Simply because my Tamil was a classical Tamil and their Tamil was, as they call it, Kochi Tamil, broken Tamil, they say. So, in the end, do you need to do a language course or do you need some, just some phrases? Probably some phrases is often easier and maybe better. Um, in some cases, when you do a research participant on observation among bankers, it's really useful to learn the jargon. But not just the bankers, also people on the street, uh, homeless people or uh, whatever. So you need, you need language skills. Do you need to mimic? When I did field work in Sri Lanka, I started doing like this, which is very common. But is it making fun of them or is it mimicking them in a positive way? I try to mean it as a positive thing, but how do people react on it? That's a very important issue in uh, participant observation. Another personal skill, totally different uh, skill, is um, to create something I call explicit attention. So be really attended to what is going on around you. What do people do? And you have to take notes all the time, not just on paper, but also in your head. And you have to train this explicit attention. You also have to train your memory because you enter a, a, a social situation, you enter a village and you want to look around and you want to see what is going on and you want to remember it afterwards. You can't take notes all the time, so you have to work on your memory. And these two go together pretty well. There are other skills. and. These skills are a bit vaguer and probably more difficult. And these skills are astonishment and naivety. It means that you have to stay a little bit naive all the time. You have to stay, as participant researcher, a little bit naive when people tell you the stories you've heard before. Because maybe there's something new in it. Or maybe you can learn something new from it. So you have to try to be fresh and open, to be a little bit detached while at the same time being involved. And that's pretty difficult. We'll discuss that later. You also need analytical imagination. And probably you can't get an analytical imagination just sitting in your chair watching a MOOC. Uh, probably you have to go out and train yourself in field work as well as analytics. So try to interpret data trying to interpret social situation. And the last skill is writing. And writing is a skill you can train and you have to train that in order to do good uh, participant observation. Because in the end you have to write it down. And if you're a great participator, if you're a great observer, it doesn't mean a thing if you can't write it down. So a classical distinction in participant observation uh, has been made by Juncker and Gold. Um, and what they say is, well, as a participant observer, you play different roles. Now, one role is the role of um, uh, someone who's relatively involved, and uh, he or she might be called an observing participant, whereas uh, others might be a little bit detached and a participating observant. And the extreme of the roles are either observant or participant. So, what they say is, as a researcher, you pick a role, and then in the end you stick with that role. Most uh, research methodologists nowadays would say, well, sometimes you're an observing participant. When you're dancing in a religious festival and you're part of it, you're probably not observing that properly. Well, maybe you're observing how not to step on someone's toe, but you're not observing the social situation that good. So maybe you're more of a participant or observing participant. Whereas at the same festival, after a while you sit down, you take your notebook and you start observing. You're a fly on the wall watching. The only way to deal with this is to reflect on it because it means that the kind of data you gather here or you gather when playing this role is a little bit different and you have to reflect on that. When talking about impression management, many people seem to think that impression management is something negative. But it's not. We do impression management all the time. When I'm taking the bus, I'm not talking to the bus driver like this. 
So when I'm taking the bus, I just give my card and so on. Um, I play a role, the role of passenger. Well, when presenting for you in this MOOC, I'm playing the role of teacher. And it's different from playing the role of father or uh, husband or um, uh, football player. Pretty bad one, actually. Um, so how do you present yourself? That's impression management. And that depends on your research, your research topic, the situation in your research. And for every researcher, this is probably slightly different. Sometimes you can present yourself as a researcher. I'm a researcher, I'm doing research on this and that. But you can only do that when people understand more or less what a researcher does. So if people expect you to, to enter in a white coat, well, to act to them as, as, as laboratory rats, they won't really like you and won't probably be the best way to present yourself. And in uh, participant observation, many people pose themselves as younger sister or younger brother or as a fellow mother. And a very good ro role we uh, can use is the, the role of a student because a student poses questions all the time. A younger sister or a younger brother poses questions all the time. So it's really easy to take on this role as a participant observer. Um, a fellow mother has probably the same experiences. So you can discuss these experiences. A fellow father probably uh, as well. In general, this is the role that is often suggested, the role of an interested outsider, the role of uh, the professional stranger. Goffman, the one who wrote a lot on impression management, once said, as a field worker, you sometimes have to play the donkey's ass. You have to be more stupid than you really are. And why? Well, simply because of this impression management. So, We've been talking about the background that is playing a role, the personal skills that is playing that are playing a role, and impression management. And I have to preach a bit. Uh, so you have to be uh, aware of those. You have to be aware of your of those these backgrounds of your skills or lack of skills, lack of language skills in my uh, case, uh, and you have to reflect on it. Um, you have to think, is this a disadvantage or an advantage? In what sense is this an advantage and in what sense is it a disadvantage? And how does it affect the quality of my material? How does it affect the relation with people and, and, and so the depth or the contextuality of the information? And thirdly, never forget how ethical is it? So. How many lies are white lies? How many impression management is okay? And all these things you have to reflect on in order to do good participant observation. Now, I'm not sure that I agree that participant observation is the coolest research method. Um, I might favor quantitative methods a little higher than that. Uh, but, of course, you can make your own decisions about what kind of research you favor. Uh, clearly, we've seen from the idea of participant observation that this requires a commitment. To get that naturally occurring data is the challenge, it seems. Uh, to become an insider, to be seen as not the outside researcher, and then to do all of those things that he talked about um, related to collecting the information, um, making the jokes, uh, doing the dances, and still making observations, um, we can see that really presents huge challenges for the researcher. But that, as he pointed out, the time and commitment by that researcher really um, benefits the project in that we get naturally occurring data. We would also want to observe that it captures more of the context. And you heard him make that aside um, about does the participant observer have a better um, understanding of survey data? And I, I think it's true. Uh, that when we understand the context very well, you know, when we're really inside of it, then we're able to understand what the new information we might get uh, means. And so something to consider for projects um, that involve research is to go maybe out to those organizations and see if you can get inside 
uh, maybe the program or maybe an activity or an outreach and just uh, experience it as a participant observer, um, just to add to what you understand about that kind of project. Now, of course, in this process, we use this idea of field notes. And so when we're talking about field notes, these are the notes that a researcher would uh, write down in his or her notebook that are those observations. And so we'd want to talk for a second about what constitutes good field notes. You heard um, Dr. Mormon talk about this idea that we want to have organized observations. And so let's take a look at this next clip where he talks about um, not Dr. Mormon, but this other researcher talks about um, how we put good field notes together and um, some tips for, for how we might record those things to benefit the research project. A field note, first of all, is not a polished research paper. It's not a finished product. A field note is a note, after all. And it's a sketch. Uh, a way, it's, it's something to jog your memory for in the future so that you'll remember what you thought was really important in what you observed uh, in the interaction among some kids or between yourself and a, and a child. It can be uh, something that you write up very soon after you've had the, the uh, field work experience so that it's fresh in your mind and you're not revising and revisiting and reviewing the experience you had. A field note is something that captures the, uh, the heart of a situation. It captures the feelings that the participant observer has or had, uh, as well as the feelings that uh, uh, he or she perceived the kids having in that situation. So a field note is something that captures that freshness so that you can remember it later. When you come back and you're using that uh, field note as a tool for writing a research paper, you want it to be as specific as possible, as concrete as possible, so that it, it recalls that experience that you had as vividly as possible. A field note has like five or so really important components. And those are that it, it conveys context. It communicates the overall picture of a, of a particular situation or circumstance. And then it focuses in, uses very concrete detail to evoke what is happening in that context. And then it, it, and it does so in a way that connects it to a particular theoretical concept so that you're not writing about anything and everything. You're writing about a very focused kind of, of activity that took place within that context. And then I think a field note, it's always in a field note, it's always important to capture character of, of the participants involved. And that may be uh, a couple of kids interacting together around a, around a computer, or it may be you yourself working with that kid. Uh, and you want to evoke your own character as well as the character of, of the child that you're, that you're working with. You want to do it in very uh, specific detail so that you um, uh, capture what that child is all about and why that child is uh, enacting certain kinds of, of uh, behaviors in that situation. What you want is to give as an, ob as an objective view of what's going on as possible. Now that's impossible. You'll discover that's impossible because everything involves subjectivity, especially in participant observation and field work. Every, you're, you're involved, you're implicated in the situation. You're not separate from the people that you are participating with. And so your interpretations are, are embedded in the, the experience that you're having. Uh, if you try to simply observe, be as, as, 
as descriptive as possible without infusing it with your own interpretation as much as possible. You'll find the limits, first of all, of your own objectivity. And that's a good thing. Uh, and then, and then you'll, you'll have, have a note, a field note later, that uh, gives you the detail, the evidence, as it were, that you need later to talk about whatever theoretical concepts or understandings that you want to talk about in your final research paper. So we can see that in that last clip, they talked about the notion of objectivity. And of course, we know that um, when you're a participant observer, you don't have the objective um, distance that you might maybe in a quantitative kind of analysis. And so as we think about field notes, of course, you're attached to the meanings that you write in the notebook and that the terms you use, the, the people you interact with, all of that is technically influenced by you as the participant observer. So we would want to um, kind of admit that that's maybe a strength and a weakness of the participant observer role. A strength because um, we know that it's uniquely experienced as a, a human and then um, maybe a weakness because it doesn't have the objectivity. We might miss some things that someone else as a human might um, experience in that research project. Now, one question you might be wondering about is can we do observations that end up with quantitative kind of data? And we saw just so far, these are all yielding um, field notes and writing and qualitative kind of data. And so now we want to talk about structured observations and kind of differentiate that from participant observation to say that I could actually look at, at behavior and I could actually count it or put quantitative um, categories in place that I might uh, detect frequencies about. And I might be able to capture quantitative kind of data through structured observation. So let's take a look at this next clip where um, this researcher talks about structured observations that result in quantitative data. All right, first of all, what is the main difference between previously discussed participant observation and what we are going to discuss now, structured observation? The difference is that with this structured observation, you are trying to quantify behavior of people. What does it mean, quantify? Well, with the participant observation, we were, of course, as observers, taking down some notes and writing down what people are doing. But with structured observation, we will be trying to do this in a structured way, meaning that we will come uh, to this workplace that we are going to observe with something that we call coding uh, sheets, and we will have a predefined uh, set of points that we are going to observe. An example would be, for instance, um, let's stick to an example of a shopping malls, and we are researching how are people choosing the boutiques, the shops into which they go. So we would stand there with this coding sheet that we have predefined ourselves, and we would say, okay, I'm going to observe these five people or first five people that I see and I'm going to check into how many shops they will enter in first three minutes. You see, you are trying to quantify, you are putting there some numbers and so that you will be able to use some statistical and quantitative analysis for the behavior of people. And this is really the interesting part about the structured observation, that you are able to use these quantitative analysis methods. All right, now when we got the basic idea, let's discuss the advantages and disadvantages of structured observation. First of all, uh, this data collection method can be sort of used by anyone, or you are one researcher, the, the main role in the whole research. Now you can employ someone to conduct this observation for you. So for instance, you make this uh, coding sheet that should be conducted on the place of observation. Now you can employ five students and they will be simply filling it in. So it can be sort of used by anyone. And that's a great advantage, especially if you would like to collect large amounts of data. Second of all, uh, this observation is a bit more reliable than the previously mentioned participant observation, especially because of the fact that you are trying to quantify the behavior of people. Generally, the quantitative methods and the quantitative part of research is a bit more reliable than the 
qualitative studies. Furthermore, we have ability to examine the relationships between events and relationships between variables. Because due to the fact that, again, we are quantifying things, we can uh, really identify events and variables. And due to that, we can examine the relationship between them. So you see, structured observation will work very well with a descriptive research nature. And finally, um, the structured observation can really get you to a natural setting. It can really get you to the phenomena, but still keeping um, this your objective view. So on one hand, you really can get the, uh, the subjective behavior of people. What do they really uh, do and how do they maybe feel about things? But you are still keeping your objective overview of this whole thing. So structured observation has a lot of advantages. On the other hand, there are also certain disadvantages. So let's discuss them. First of all, you will need to be in the place when the events are happening. And this is a general disadvantage of observation compared to, for instance, to interviews. So for instance, if you are researching some market failure, well, if you would like to research this market failure using interviews, then what you can do is that you simply interview the people that were sort of part of this market failure. And it can happen three months or even one year later. But if you are trying to research it through observation, you will really need to come to a place that is directly right now being influenced by this market failure. So the disadvantage is that you have to be in the place. Now, the second disadvantage is a bit more serious, and that is that you will have to often make inferences. What, what is an inference? Well, basically, there are two things when you are doing research. You can use um, let's take an example of statistics. There are two parts of statistics. One is called descriptive statistics and another one is called inferential statistics. Descriptive statistics, that's the simple part. You are just describing things. So, for instance, you are making some simple graphs about um, the, the amount of people who have visited the shopping mall on a given day. And you just make a simple graph out of it. But if you are going for inferential statistics, that's much more complicated. You need to use some inferential tools. And this is exactly an example of a structured observation. You are quantifying the behavior of people and then you are trying to make inferences out of this behavior. So if you're going for a structured observation, you need to be prepared to work with a little bit of inferential statistics. All right, so that is all about the observation. I mean, the observation is a great uh, primary data collection method and it can really fit your research very well. Now it will be just upon you if you will choose participant or a structured observation. And I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next videos where we will discuss more of the data collection techniques. So we've seen that structured observations can yield quantitative kind of data. And that is something that we know we can put in our tool belt. As a researcher, it's something that we can do to try to get a sense of what's going on when we use observations. Now, as we collectively think about ethnography and participant observation and structured observation, um, when we look at that whole area, we would want to observe that most of the data honestly collected in that area really is qualitative. And so we know that um, while there are opportunities to do quantitative measurement, um, we would observe that mostly that ends up being qualitative kind of data. Now, a side note that I want to talk about for a second is the notion of grounded theory. Um, you may have heard about this theory that was developed largely by Glasser and Strauss in the 1960s. And um, they were advancing this notion of grounded theory. And that's the idea that we would, as researchers, collect qualitative data and then we would constantly revise the theory to reflect the data. And so to the extent that the theory um, represented the, the continual data collection that was going on, then that would make it an effective theory. Um, in that way, when we think about grounded theory, it goes through that continual um, test of does it reflect what's going on in the field of study, and then also um, does it get the revision, and that's kind of something we don't see much in other areas of theory development if you've studied theory at all. Now, as we think about grounded theory, um, I would refer you also to a current uh, 
researcher out there who uses grounded theory, and that's Dr. Brene Brown. Dr. Brown has written a few books, um, some of them Daring Greatly, uh, Rising Strong. She just came out with a new book called Braving the Wilderness. And what she does to generate the outcomes of these books is she uses grounded theory by continually interviewing people. And when she interviews them, um, she's gathering the data and then constantly revising the theories that she is advancing in the books. And so maybe you'd pick that up and see it as an example of grounded theory. Now, the next clip we're going to see um, gives us a little bit of background on grounded theory. And then after that, we'll talk about um, interviewing specifically. The most cited work in qualitative analysis definitely is the discovery of grounded theory. Discovery of grounded theory was written by Glaser and Strauss in 1967. And it has become really, really popular throughout the qualitative analysis landscape. Why is that? Why is grounded theory so immensely popular? Well, probably because it's often miscited, but that's a bit of a false argument. Why it's so popular is because of its influential key concepts. Several key concepts in grounded theory, several key elements in grounded theory were really revolutionary, new, and triggered the sociological imagination of many researchers. Second reason why it's so popular is because it, it, it was one of the first books in which the complete book was about a certain a specific methodology and it was highly detailed. So it would help you in giving rules how to go about in your research and to help you in taking small steps in your interpretation and then still ground it to the data. And lastly, the last 20 years it has become really popular due to software. Software developers found out that grounded theory was ideal to translate into software tools. Key concepts from grounded theory, key rules in grounded theory were pretty easily transposed to software. And therefore, new qualitative researchers that, that touched upon uh, qualitative analysis started with, these, with this software and then ended up with doing or reading about grounded theory. So therefore, grounded theory is extremely popular nowadays. It was revolutionary in 1967. It was very new, it was innovative. Why? Why was this so revolutionary? Well, in the 1960s, there was another view of science pretty dominant, especially in American sociology. It was more about deduction, about grand theories that were applied, discussions were going on about how to do research top down or bottom up. And there were discussions going on about, about theoretical imagination uh, versus uh, rigorous methodologies. But grounded theory was revolutionary because it didn't say we are going to do theory or we are going to do data analysis. No, what they said was we are going to link data analysis with theory. And grounded theory was inductive as opposed to much of the deductive work, but it was a naive inductivism. Grounded theory was also revolutionary because what they said was data analysis takes place during data collection. And obviously ethnographers did that for ages, but in sociology, this was pretty new. And many people would first get the data and then start analyzing or start writing. It was also revolutionary because they were very much against the hypothetical deductive view of science that was pretty popular at that time. And they said, well, what these hypothesis checkers are doing is they're not testing their hypothesis, but they're just checking their theory. So they're not falsifying, they're verifying their theory. And if they can't verify their theory, they say the hypothesis is wrong, um, but the theory is still okay. And what they do is they create new hypotheses that become really small and less linked to the live world of people and the study. So, so it, it, it becomes less relevant, they said. 
And they were also revolutionary because they said, we need qualitative analysis, not for description. We need qualitative analysis because of the deficit of this hypothetical deductive view. We need qualitative analysis in order to create theories. We need to build theories. So, pretty revolutionary. And what are the key elements then in this grounded theory? What are these influential key concepts? Well, the most important concept in grounded theory is constant comparison. It was so important that at first they even planned to call the book the constant comparative method because this is central. It's not about coding. It's not about the revolutionary bit. This is revolutionary, the constant comparison. What's this constant comparison? Well, I will show you. For instance, you interviewed this first hippie. You remember it's 1967, the summer of love. You interview him about his views on the world, about love and peace. And then you go about and interview the second person. And what you do is you compare them. You compare what this person says to what this person says. And then you compare it to this person. And when you do comparison, you can compare interview one with interview two. And in order to do so, you have to reach a higher level. Why? Because always when you compare, especially when you compare three, four, five different interviews, you have to reach a higher level in order to do this comparison. You need a more abstract level. So you reach concepts. So when comparing this interview with this interview, with this interview, with this interview, at a certain point of time, you start to talk about similarities and differences. And these are on a more abstract level. So at first you're comparing data with data. And then later on, you're start, you start comparing these concepts with new data. And then new data again, and new data again, and new data again, and again. So what you do is, Compare data with data, data with concepts, concepts with data, and then you start to compare concepts with concepts. So these are little steps you take. Constantly you're comparing data, 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 concepts, concepts, concepts. And that's revolutionary. Second key element of ground theory is its strong focus on the research process as a process. How? Well, first, they use the concept of Bloomer about sensitizing concepts. Every concept is temporary and they're provisional. They, they give some guidance, but that's it. You shouldn't pin them down. They're not written in stone. Concepts are temporary and you develop them throughout your research. So it's a processual approach. The second bit is that you're testing for deviant cases. Like in analytic induction, you are on the lookout for deviant cases. In your constant comparison, you try to find these deviant cases because they help you. Similarities help you, definitely. But contradictions help you probably much more. A third aspect of this focus on, on process is the writing of memos. Way more important than coding is the writing of memos in grammar theory. In order to build your theory, create your transparency, your famous audit trail, and reflect. The third key element of grammar theory, and the third revolutionary aspect of grammar theory, is that sampling in grammar theory is completely different from sampling in survey research. In survey research, you take a small sample with which you try to say something about the population. In qualitative analysis, that's often ridiculous. What you want to do is to take a small sample and say something about theory. So what you try to do is not representation, but saturation. You try to have theoretical saturation. A theoretical saturation you reach when your theory is so sophisticated that every new data point Every new interview does not lead to more refinement of your concepts or your categories that you've created. The fourth key element of grammar theory is, as I said before, the creation of a theory. Rather than just describing, 
Glazer and Strauss said, we need theories, theories that are connected, grounded in the data. So what steps do we need to take then when doing grounded theory? Well, as Glazer later said, all is data. So when you gather your material, you can gather everything. You can get it, you can use interviews, you can use observation, you can use advertisements, you can use anything that is relevant for you. So all is data. And then when you do this constant comparison, you compare data with data and concepts will arise. And not just a single concept, but many concepts. And from these concepts, new categories uh, arise. And these categories, they do not arise automatically. No, they arise because you compare a concept with a concept. And you say, well, maybe they fit in. Maybe there's a, this is a subform of this category. So you try to organize all these different concepts into categories. Many people would call these codes. And then you try to link those categories to certain properties, probably some conditions or consequences or any other properties of these categories. And you try to link these categories to each other by relations or theses or theorems or whatever you want to call them. But you try to relate these categories. And in the end, you try to create a core category, a single category that is the most important aspect of your complete theory. And you try to build a storyline around this core category. So this looks pretty simple, but is it? Well, obviously it's not. In later forms of grounded theory, many discussions how to go about and how to do this and how to take these steps have been uh, held. Now this core category is very important in thinking about different levels of theories, different types of theories. As you can see here, there are two dimensions of grounded theories. First, there's the dimension of substantive versus a formal theory, and there's the dimension of micro-theory up to macro-theory. Usually, grounded theories start around here, more micro-level based and substantive. But the goal of a grounded theory in the long run is to get to more formal level theories. What does it mean? Well, it means that here you describe a bit more. You get to a theoretical level, but your theory is applicable to a certain substantive field. Whereas if you develop your theory more and more and more, probably, or that's at least what you strive for, your theory will be applicable to more different substantive fields and then become more formal. And it might become more macro, but it doesn't need to be. So there are different grounded theories. And in another lecture I will show that there are different forms of grounded theory based on different authors. So I like this example of grounded theory because it helps us understand how the theory and the research have a relationship. And of course we know that research without theory um, doesn't make a lot of sense. And so when we think about um, academic research we would make that connection of course and see grounded theory as a really great example of how we might bring those two together. Um, now the next part of our show, we have an opportunity to talk more in depth about interviewing. And when I was thinking about covering this topic, I thought it would be best to bring in an expert to help us understand how to conduct research um, such as field interviews or um, any kind of informational interview that we might use in projects to do our research. And so when we come back, we'll hear from Dr. Stacy Young um, about her expertise in interviewing. You are watching DHTV from California State University, Dominguez Hills. Welcome back. I have a guest today on the show, Dr. Stacy Young, who is an interviewing expert. And I have invited her here to the show to help us to learn about what makes a really good interviewer um, perform better in his or her job. So welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm glad to have you. I appreciate your expertise. Uh, the thing that we were thinking in having you on the show was, uh, you know, a lot of us talk about interviewing and talk about uh, doing that, but it's really a precise skill. And so I thought I'd have someone like you to help us learn more about that. 
Great. Yeah, I definitely think it's a skill that needs to be practiced and honed, and I'm excited to talk about it with you today. Okay, great. So let's start with your background. Okay. So uh, how do you arrive here as the expert in interviewing? Okay. Well, I'm a professor in the Department of Communication Studies at Cal State Long Beach, and I have been teaching and consulting on interviewing for the past about 20 years. Okay, and so as you have done that role, what would you say are the general skills you think an interviewer would need to have? Well, the, there are a variety of skills I think are helpful for an interviewer. Uh, the first one I would say is listening skills, and that to many people seems obvious, but as the interviewer, you are really multitasking. You're doing mm -hmm. a lot of things. You're managing the flow of the conversation. You might be taking notes and trying to record information, and a lot of times people get hung up with thinking about what they're going to ask next, so they're worried about their role and not so much paying attention to the interviewee. So mm -hmm. listening skills and really being able to pay attention and focus on what the person is saying is definitely a skill I think okay. people need to have. Another skill is interpersonal communication skills, being mm -hmm. able to create that connection with the person that you're interviewing, make them feel comfortable um, and willing to uh, give you as much information as possible. And then the last skill I would say is adaptability or ability to think on your feet. <laughs> um, I see a lot of new uh, interviewers where they will stick too closely to their schedule of questions and they won't kind of go with the flow of the conversation and deviate from it. So the ability to, to veer off or away from your original plan uh, can be helpful for an interviewer. So that's interesting. So I'm thinking about the, the listening. It seems like that's something you could practice and be better at. Mm -hmm. And then you talked about um, the being able to kind of think on your feet. Can you can you learn to do that? Like is that something that comes through practice or the best way, I think, to get it is through practice, but you can practice with your friends, your family. It doesn't have to be in a formal interview situation. It's just that ability to kind of flow with the conversation instead of sticking to what your original plan might be. So that, that kind of has a little risk, it seems like. Yes. Like definitely. you don't know where it's going to go. Exactly. And I think that's why new interviewers tend to focus on the questions that they've prepared ahead of time. Mm. They know those questions. They're comfortable with those questions. Right. And whereas when you're having to think on your feet, it gets it puts you in more of a vulnerable position for sure. But then maybe the payoff, it seems to me it's kind of a, a risky move, but it maybe has a payoff with it. Like that if I decided to maybe explore an area that I wasn't perfectly comfortable with, I might discover something Maybe that's even better than what I originally planned. I don't know. Yeah. What do you think about that? Yeah, absolutely. I think that that's really the benefit of it is that a lot of times people go in thinking they know what they want to find out, mm. but if they open their ears to the listening <laughs> and think and be able to adapt on their feet to the questions, they might end up getting a lot better information than what they even originally thought they could. Hmm. Yeah, that's good. Um, I guess the one area, of course, that's communication-based, you talked about relating interpersonally. Mm -hmm. um, break that down for us. What what kind of uh, skills or behaviors would you say belong in that conversation? Uh, well, so there are a couple of things related to that. And the first one uh, is rapport building at the beginning of the interview. That really is a proactive approach that can pay off in the long run. So taking a few moments at the beginning of the interview to try to connect with the person in some way, whether it's finding a commonality between you and the person that you're interviewing mm -hmm. or just getting them to talk, kind of warm up to the process before diving right in. That's one way to create that connection. But then throughout mm -hmm. the interview, a lot of it has to do with your nonverbal communication. Are you making eye contact? Are you responding with uh-huhs and go-ons and nodding your head and that sort of a mm -hmm. thing and seeming engaged and interested in what it is they're saying? So um, how, do we, how do we, I guess, get better at that? Because it seems like if we practiced and did those things, we might be better, but are there people that are generally kind of more skilled than others or is it teachable? It's definitely teachable. I mean, I think some people feel more comfortable with it or it could mm -hmm. be it's more second nature to them. Mm. But I think as long as you're aware of wanting to improve on your nonverbal communication, you can. And you can even ask uh, friends or family members to kind of assess your nonverbal communication, give you feedback yeah. and that sort of a thing to see if you're not if if you're not able to practice in a formal situation. So that's kind of an interesting idea. One of the things I always wonder about, and I'd love to get your opinion, is should we pre-test, should we, should we practice, should we pre-test questions? Like if I'm going out to an organization to get information about it, should I practice like on a family member like you're saying to 
to do that or what would you say? That's a great question. I think that if you're able and have the time and resources to pre-test your questions, it can be really helpful because something that might seem really clear in your mind um, or that the person will be able to respond to the way you want them to, it might not always go that way. So being able right. to pre-test with someone, uh, with someone in the field or in the category that you're mm. interviewing can be very helpful. But if you're not able to do that, even with your friends and family, just to kind of bounce it off of someone because the way you phrase your questions in an interview is extremely important. And so it's definitely worth taking the time for that pre-planning. I like that comment about practicing the questions with an air, it, with someone from the area that mm -hmm. has the knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, something that strikes me as an interviewer is when I go somewhere and I don't speak their acronyms mm -hmm. or their special labels, that I might not know that, right, as an interviewer, mm -hmm. that my questions are unusual. Exactly, right. Or <laughs> for that setting, maybe? Exactly. Or their answers you might not be able to follow along with because you're not as familiar with what, mm. the, what they're giving back to you. So it makes it harder for you to follow up as an interviewer with questions if you're not understanding the terminology that they're using. Okay, so that actually is a very interesting area that I hadn't thought of till now, which is I probably have to learn the organization or the person on some level, like their language before I, I get there. Um, so it seems like preparation, we didn't talk about that, but as far as learning the history or the background, it seems like really crucial to do my, my homework, so to speak. A hundred percent. Many people kind of mm -hmm. neglect that step. A lot of people underestimate the role of interviewer. They think, I'm going to ask a couple of questions. They're going to be doing most of the talking, so I just have to come up with my questions, mm -hmm. and that's it. But if you're able to do your homework and find out information, you'll come up with stronger questions from the get-go, mm -hmm. and you'll also just be more confident and prepared in the actual interview. So Right. So let's talk about one of the areas that I wonder about. Um, sometimes I could find myself in an interview and have maybe a, a sticky area or like a weakness that I want to ask about. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of guidelines would you give us for asking about maybe sensitive material? Well, my first piece of advice would be to build that rapport from the beginning because people are going to be more likely to disclose information to you if they feel comfortable with you. So that that is such a crucial part of the interviewing process. But then beyond that, the way you phrase your questions can make a big difference. You know, say for example, you want to ask about a weakness. Well, people don't love talking about weaknesses, <laughs> but you just change the word to area of improvement mm -hmm. and people will be more likely to um, share information. So being kind of mindful of the terminology of the words that you're using in your questions. Yeah, that's kind of interesting. Um, now, related to that is this notion about recording interviews. Mm -hmm. And I always feel like I don't have the, the true expertise to comment on that. Like, mm -hmm. is it common to use recording devices or not, or write notes? Like, what would you recommend? So it depends on the type of interview, but I do recommend audio recording your interviews if you are able to do so, because again, as the interviewer, you're juggling many things, and so you're probably going to miss some information if you just are trying to take notes in the interview. But if you cannot audio record the interview, or if you want to um, take notes, uh, then that's definitely a way to go. I do recommend that you do take some form of notes, even if you're audio mm. recording, just so that you can follow up with questions without having to interrupt the person. Person, um, so you don't forget what it is you want to ask them uh, if they say a comment or something. And so I recommend note taking to some degree. Mm -hmm. But again, that's another skill that takes practice because most people, when they take notes, are in a position of being a passive receiver of information, much like a student mm -hmm. in a class. But in the interview, you're you're interactive, so right. you are doing many things. And yeah. so being able to take notes while listening, while asking questions, takes practice. So that multitasking comes into mm -hmm. play again. That's kind of an interesting idea that we would take notes while we're audio recording. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not something I've thought of before. Mm -hmm. I think I think maybe either or, like mm -hmm. I would be writing notes or recording. Right. But that's kind of interesting that I might miss, as you say, maybe some prompts or some follow-up questions mm -hmm. while someone's recording and, and may maybe fail to ask actually something important. Right. And it's it's kind of just a backup just in case your mm -hmm. audio recorder um, fails you. Yeah, true. And also, a kind of it makes people feel important when you write down a few things that they say and so it create it helps with that kind of creating the good vibe of the interview that you're looking for. And I feel like I should have done that now that you're saying about I have this pen here and <laughs> I haven't I haven't written down a single thing so I'm going to pretend to write something. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Makes um, me feel important. That's good uh, because I've realized that I haven't done that. Um, so 
As far as the challenges, you know, you teach people this skill all the time. Yeah. Um, what do you think are a few of the challenges that people face? Um, you talked about multitasking. What, what else would be on the list? Well, uh, I think being mindful of the influence that you have as an interviewer on the situation. So making sure that you're asking neutral, um, open-ended questions can make a difference. Mm -hmm. And uh, another challenge that interviewers have is managing the environment that you're in, that you're doing mm. the interview in. So you want to be mindful that you're in a location that the person feels comfortable disclosing whatever mm -hmm. it is you may be asking them about. And also that you're mindful of distractions that might throw you off or might throw them off if they get interrupted or disturbed in some way. Oh, that's interesting. So I haven't thought too much about location. Um, that's a very interesting notion that especially combining that with like a weakness. Mm -hmm. So if I set someone up potentially to talk about an area of improvement or a mm -hmm. weakness, and mm -hmm. then I put them in an environment that's not very positive, mm -hmm. I probably have strangled the communication on some level, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Now, um, one of the things to ask you about is when you do your training, you talked about rapport being the first, mm -hmm. uh, kind of the, the stepping stone, mm -hmm. I guess, to being able to do the interview. Mm -hmm. What do you think is the most important tool of the interviewer? Like, I have my opinion, but what would you say is the... Mm. I would say the definitely the wording of the questions make mm. a big important part of how the interview is going to go. Okay. Uh, so I would encourage people to be mindful of the phrasing of their questions. Mm -hmm. You can ask a closed-ended question and still get a long-winded response. <laughs> yeah. You can ask an yeah. open-ended question and get a short response, yeah. but it's it sets you up for success if you're really strategic in the questions and the way you have them phrased. And then another sort of tidbit that people don't often think about is the end of the interview and how you close the interview is important. Okay. Um, um, you want to make sure that you leave the door open for future conversation uh, with the person that you're interviewing in case you have any follow-up questions or mm -hmm. uh, you go back and you realize you missed notes that you, you thought you knew what you meant in your shorthand mm -hmm. and then you get back and that sort right. of thing. And I even recommend sometimes uh, sending a thank you note or email or something mm -hmm. of that nature because that creates a good feeling between you and the interviewee and makes them maybe more likely to refer a friend if you're trying to do a snowball sample, that sort of a thing. Right. So that can be another good strategy for you to use as an interviewer. I'm writing that down because <laughs> I, I, not that you're not important, but I want to make sure that you feel important. Thank you. Um, so... Uh, that kind of got me thinking, though, about it, on an interview, is it customary to provide a copy? Like, let's say I was doing it for research purposes mm -hmm. or exploratory field kind of research, mm -hmm. maybe informational interviewing. Um, is it customary to provide a copy back to the person I interview? What would you say about that? Uh, you mean of your notes or the questions? I don't know. Just, mm -hmm. I mean, you have the audio recording is right. one or, or maybe some of the answers when mm -hmm. you when you refine your notes? I don't know. Right. So, so when I do research with interviews, oftentimes I will give their responses back to the people that I interviewed to mm -hmm. allow them to either clarify something or maybe eliminate something like, I wish mm. I hadn't have shared this with you or I don't want this to be part of the report or that sort of a oh, thing. Oh, that's very interesting. Yeah. I don't know that it's uh, necessarily customary or required, but uh -huh. that is something I've done in research interviews for sure. Yeah. So that's interesting to me because then you might using that strategy get actually even a, a newer level mm -hmm. on some like because if you if you ask somebody why did you cross that out why did you not want to talk about it right or why do you have so many more things to say about this topic that maybe you didn't think to ask about which right which is kind of interesting exactly. i sometimes think about regret like mm -hmm. um, a lot of things or a lot of times I hear people talk about interviewing and saying, I wish I had said this. Mm -hmm. And they say it often as the interviewee. Mm -hmm. um, and so maybe that handles that on some level. Mm -hmm. You know, after you're interviewed, you think, oh, I should have said this other thing or I should have. Uh, absolutely, because I think people do. They go back, they kind of ruminate a little bit yeah. about the interview and they think, oh, I wish I had added more or done this differently. Uh -huh. And so it gives them that opportunity to do that. And you do get a lot more information that way. Yeah, that's that's very good. So, um the last question to ask you is, um, what advice uh, would you give overall? And I know you've given some advice, actually, so it's, it maybe duplicates. But uh, what kind of advice would you give someone who hasn't really done uh, research interviewing, per se? I would say definitely do your homework ahead of time so mm -hmm. that you feel prepared and confident. Uh, don't underestimate the power of the rapport building at the beginning mm -hmm. of the interview. Try really hard to deviate from your schedule of questions and follow up with what the person is saying so that it feels more conversational. A good interview feels like a conversation with extra questions, basically. So really mm. working on that. Um, and then 
being mindful of the way you're phrasing your questions, and finally, closing strongly. Um, so the best way to do all of this is just practice. Practice yeah. with anyone that, and any, anyone that's willing. <laughs> yeah, so gather the family and friends, yeah. uh, fellow students, whatever, and, uh, and practice. And I think that's something that maybe is becoming a lost art a little mm -hmm. bit, that um, in this day and age where we rush around and we have all these different ideas that we're doing, uh, maybe that's the, the good news is that we still can actually engage in regular communication with each other mm -hmm. and, uh, and practice these skills. Absolutely. I think so, too. Yeah. So, well, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I really appreciate it. Um, we enjoyed hearing from you about some of the tips that you would give us and, um, and of course, the great reminder about uh, rapport, communication, mm -hmm. and uh, getting out there and becoming better. All right. Well, it was my pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. You are watching DHTV from California State University, Dominguez Hills. So now we have a chance to turn our focus on to secondary data collection. Previously, we have talked about primary data collection. Remember, that's the kind of research that you and I conduct where we are uh, doing original research. But when we talk about secondary data collection, we're talking about research that was already conducted for a different reason. We might find it, though, to be very informative for our projects. So let's take a look at this next clip that talks about secondary data collection specifically. So the definition of secondary data is very clear. Secondary data are data that have already been collected for some other purpose than your research. So the definition is super clear, but I see often students misunderstand it a bit when it comes to use of secondary data for their research. The first question that might arise, why, would, or why should we use data that have been collected by someone else for some completely different purpose? Well, the idea is that uh, data or data collection is an expense. It is sort of expensive to collect the data. Let's say that you have to travel, so you are going to have some travel expenses. Of course, you are going to have time expenses. So collecting a data is an expense. If you use data that have already been collected, well, you will save these costs. Now, the other question that might arise, why would someone allow us to use his or her data? It's obviously, this person had some expenses and now it should be us who will use this data. Well, also the data analysis is an expense. So a great example is a government. Government is collecting these demographical data about the population, like what is the average age of the population, what is the occupancy, where are people living and so on. So government is uh, more than willing uh, to collect these data and have the expense with the collecting of these data. And now they will sort of give it out for free for people and researchers to use these data for their analysis because government just do not have the capacities uh, to analyze these data. So these governmental uh, demographical data are a great example of a secondary data that we can use for our research. Let's talk about the advantages and disadvantages of secondary data. Now, for the advantages, we have already discussed the first one, and that is that they are sort of cheap to obtain because we do not have to collect them ourselves. Now, a second advantage is that we can sort of cross-compare secondary data that someone else has collected and primary data that we have collected. And this is a very common practice. So let's say we collect a lot of these demographical information or demographical data that government originally collected and we just use them as a secondary data source. And then we by ourselves collect some specific small amount of primary data and we cross compare these two. And thanks to that, we will get some interesting research results. So that is second advantage. We can do this cross comparison. Now, third advantage is that we can use secondary data to have great primary data collection. I know it might sound hairy, but uh, let's think of it this way. We have, let's stick to the example of these governmental demographic data. So we take them as a secondary data and from them, we as a researchers learn something about the population that is out there. And thanks to this knowledge that we have obtained from secondary data, we will be better able to collect the primary data. So for instance, we will know that with our questionnaire, we should aim for people who are aged 
25 to 30 because this is the age group uh, that is mostly working in the field that we are interested in. So secondary data can allow us to have greater or better primary data collection. Now let's go for the disadvantages of using secondary data. First disadvantage that I really have to mention is that I see students very often misunderstand what secondary data are. Yes, it's really true. Just keep in mind uh, the definition of secondary data. It's the data that have been collected for some other purpose than your research. So first example of misunderstanding can be Let's say that you are reading through blogs of experts in the field and you are reading through academic articles. Those are not secondary data. Yes, it has been created by someone else, but it's not data, it's information. And these articles and blogs are actually going into your literature review. So it's not data and hence it's not secondary data. Another misunderstanding example can be you are going for these uh, governmental demographic data. And you feel like, hey, I'm collecting these data myself. I'm accessing those databases. I'm retrieving the data. I can consider it being primary data collection. But no, those are secondary data. So if you plan to use secondary data, be very clear about the definition and be sure that you know what secondary data are. Second disadvantage of secondary data is that even though you find some secondary data that might be useful for your research, they do not really fit your research purpose. Let's say that um, your research is about um, how income of people influences the choice of their dwelling. Where do they live? Are they living in a flat or are they living in a house? And so you would access these governmental demographic data and you would feel like, wow, I'm pretty sure I can find this information there. And in those demographical data, you will find all kinds of useful information such as uh, gender, age, you will even find income, you will find occupancy. But one, that last thing you will not find there, and that is the dwelling type. Where do people live? So quite often it happens that even though you find great secondary data source, um, they will not fit your research purpose so that they are not really useful for you. And final disadvantage is that you do not have control over data quality. The fact is that these data that you are going to use as a secondary data have been collecting by someone else and you can never be sure whether this person really followed the research methodologies and data collection methodologies and so that you cannot be sure if these data are really unbiased or maybe some biases occur there. So we have to be really careful with the use of these. So let's conclude it quickly about the use of secondary data for our research and then in the upcoming videos we will jump into primary data collection techniques. So secondary data can be really useful for your research but as we have discussed uh, there are certain pitfalls that you have to be aware of when you are going to use these secondary data. So as you complete your research projects, of course, you will have to make the uh, evaluation of whether you want to use secondary data. Now, we've seen from the clip, there's a few different reasons to do it. Uh, it's cheaper and it gives us a comprehensive view. I mean, just those two reasons alone might be reasons to use secondary data. But the comment that I would make is maybe to think about using secondary data as either the inspiration to do primary research or vice versa, right? To say that maybe um, when I do my primary data collection, then I understand it better after I look at secondary data. So you could kind of flip-flop that and think about if I want to do primary, secondary, or both. Um, I would advocate, of course, uh, using both because I think it gives us a greater comprehension of the area that we're studying. So today we have looked at really the concept of primary data collection. We've talked about how we previously covered surveys. We've talked about ethnography, participant observation, um, and doing field interviews. And so we have really covered that area in terms of thinking especially about some of the qualitative methods available. And then we've also talked about secondary data um, and observed that there's some really good reasons to use secondary data analysis. Um, for the research that we conduct and as a springboard maybe for um, understanding it uh, or possibly understanding the, the outcomes that we get from a primary data um, collection pro process. 
So um, in total, we've looked at those two processes and that will wrap up our show for today. So thank you so much for watching. And um, this is Dr. Pamela Kreiser, hoping your day is not just different, but significantly different. <laughs>